This presentation is one that came from a symposium that my team put together for the Southeastern Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And Spencer Griffith is our deputy director now. He came to us as our marketing manager. And this presentation is one that he put together that I liked enough to say, hey, Stephanie, I would do that at RBFF. I will do it wherever, because this is the good stuff. This is where we learn about our audience in a different way. Um, the more we know about the people we're trying to reach, the easier it is for us to spend our time and money being effective. We're just gonna launch into it. So I have all these brands. You recognize most of those. What do they have in common? Brand recognition, what else? Money. What do you think of when I say Chick-fil-A? My pleasure. Same with Ritz Carlton. I actually just read an article that the reason they say my pleasure at Chick-fil-A is because the leader of uh, Chick-fil-A went to the Ritz Carlton and said, I really like that. We are no longer saying you're welcome. What about Publix? Does any of you have a Publix in your area? What do you think about when you think about that grocery store? Uh, maybe, <laughs> we don't have those. These, these brands at different points have been known for really high customer satisfaction because they are very customized to the customer. You think about Amazon. Amazon knows stuff you want before you know that stuff you want existed. They're very good at that. So Spencer did this amazing job of compiling so much research out there to build this. And I had him send me the list of um, resources and sources for all of these facts. It's a lot. If you need it, you're gonna have to email me. But these are the things that customers expect of businesses that they interact with now post pandemic. We have to make sure they're having a positive customer experience with us and 80% say customer service is just as important as the products and services, which means their interaction with our agencies is just as important as them going out in the field. They would pay more for better customer service. One, one in three, one in three customers will like bug out after one bad interaction. And 92% will figure out other things to do with their free time after two or three negative interactions. And I think about just stuff that we have experienced over the years with our licensing systems and when it goes down at the worst possible time. And I'm not necessarily talking about Arkansas. I worked in other states as well. Like we are competing for people's time. It's not a given that they're gonna go hunting and fishing on that Saturday. They expect connected journeys. And what that means to me is that I go in and I sign up for Hunter Ed. And then I expect that you know that I have Hunter Ed when I go to buy my license. And when I buy my license, my hunting license, I expect you to know that I had a fishing license last year. So these, this is an expectation of our customers from us right now. It's not it's still a new thing for us as wildlife agencies to be able to know all of these things. They want it personalized. They, I don't want you to send me an email about a, I don't have little kids, don't send me a family event. If you're a 21 year old guy, you don't want an email about the Becoming an Outdoors Woman workshop. We want things to be personalized to who we are and we expect the companies that we are doing business with to know about us as customers. We want, um, we want you to know who we are. And when you, when you ask a question, you expect immediate responses to questions. I will give you an example. I just, during our little break, realized that something was wrong with my United reservation when I tried to check in. And so I went on, I went and I called it because I tried to log in. It said, you need to contact customer service. And I was like, oh no, not United Customer Service. 
And I called and they said, do you want to do this over text? We'll text you. And then all of a sudden I was texting with an AI and then all of a sudden the AI is like, you're going to need a customer service representative. And I was texting with a customer service representative who fixed the issue. It turns out my flight that is tomorrow is not May 15th. It, the system got messed up. So that immediate response to questions, we are really used to. Um, is that true of wildlife agencies when something's not going right with your auto renew or your license? Maybe not. Customers expect innovations, especially after 2020. They, they want us to be pushing far, further and faster digitally than maybe most government agencies are willing and able to do. And customer expectations are evolving. And I like this chart. I think this chart's really useful because definitely when I started in this career, we were in this past, like, oh gosh, I have to, I have to go online to buy a license? Oh, I would rather just go talk to somebody. Now we're like, I, I think my app should be able to buy my license 24 seven. I should never actually need to go to a game and fish office I want to control where and when. I expect that you know everything about me and everything I've ever done with your organization. I want to mobile message you rather than call. And the content just needs to be put in front of me. And you know, like Lauren was talking to me earlier, she's our marketing person, about how often our customers are seeing our messaging and how much we put our stuff in front of them. So this is what, according to research, this is what customers value from you. Efficiency, they want to get stuff done quickly. They want it to be convenient and friendly. They want to make it easy payment. Um, human interaction, that's definitely in the middle of the pack. And then you look at like the things at the bottom. It doesn't need to be fun. It doesn't need to be charitable. It doesn't need to have a great atmosphere or brand image. It needs to be efficient, easy, friendly, and knowledgeable. So as an educator, knowing my audience is the first thing. Anytime I'm asked to speak or create something, I start with the audience. And so when we think about different audiences we're working with, we still have the audience, the great generation. I didn't, we don't have a slide for them. But knowing who your audience is helps you cater to that audience. So baby boomers, when you're talking to them, you value their time. You, you're telling them thank you. You're dealing, you're giving them a solution. And like, they want all the information. Tell me how this goes. Tell me how this goes. Tell me what's going to happen next year. If I give you my email address, tell me what you're going to do with it and how often. And you've encountered all of that. This, that's, these three things makes it easy for them to say, oh, yes, uh, wildlife agency. I, I want to be on your list, and I want to I I work with you all the time. Gen X, which is my, my group. I'm right on the end of that Gen X world. Um, informal digital communication. If I don't have to pick up the phone, like when United said you need to call the customer service line, my stomach dropped. Like, oh, do I have to talk to them? Can't. And then when they said, you can text with us, I said, thank goodness. Um, these. This generation, we're the ones who go to the website and there's that little box that says, do you need anything? And we're like, yes, thank you very much. Um, I want it fast. I want it on the website. If it doesn't exist on your website, does it actually exist in the world? And um, I want to be like, this generation wants to be able to leave immediate feedback. Hey, I went to your store. And it sucked today. Um, or this person went so far above and beyond, 
I want to tell you that because if I were you, I'd want to know that about my staff, about my employees. And like I said, don't make me talk on the phone. Millennials, which a lot of you are millennials, um, they want information quickly. And this generation tends to want, and you know, these are sweeping generalizations, but they want that customized experience. Like when I log in, I want to see the stuff that I've already done. I want to see the stuff that I'm interested in. Please make it custom to me. They want a positive attitude. Like, don't give me reality. Give me a little hearts and stars and flowers and like, hey, you're the best ever because you came here to buy a fishing license. I don't want to talk on the phone either. Like, there's a, there's a lot of ways to communicate and get information done without talking to a human being on the phone. And then the next two are the ones that took some research because in leadership land, we talk about multi-generational workplaces and we do these trainings. And this is the generation that's just walking in our doors right now as a, as a workplace. So thinking about this Gen Z generation, they, they expect you to have an app, a website, they expect you to be available via social media, this omni-channel, like you're everywhere they're at. They expect that. Surprisingly, these folks, because they like that, I want to access you however I feel like in the moment, are much more willing to pick up the phone and talk to a person again. And they want to tell you, they want to yelp, they want to tell you about their experience. I want to give you five stars. And so, like, they'll either give you five stars or they'll make you go viral because something was terrible. So this is one that, like, if you're not doing it right, they're going to uh, um, potentially make your organization blow up into something that becomes a PR nightmare. Um, again, I think... I think all of us, and since the invention of smartphones, I think we all really think things should be immediate. Like, I, I wanted United to fix my check-in issue today. I did not want to go to the airport tomorrow and stand in a line and talk to a person. I wanted it done so I don't have to think about it. But these folks, they're the ones that expect it to be virtual agents, or that IVR, that, like, you know, like you can kind of feel when you're talking to uh, the, the virtual reality assistants. And there's a lot of stuff in the news right now. If you watch John Oliver, he had a whole section on Sunday just about virtual reality and um, what that technology is doing and what it means for the future. Generation Alpha, this is... Um, this is the kids out there, but the kids influence the parents, right? Kid influencers. Several of you have probably heard of somebody like Jojo Siwa or any number of those YouTube stars. This is a $25 billion industry. Those kids get so famous and make so much money because they get the attention of every other kid. The other thing is that um, these kids are starting to interact with social media. Like, if you look at 2013, those are 10 year olds. So they're just coming on to social media. This generation will change how social media looks. All these kids, not all, a lot of these kids have things like their own phone, they wear things like an Apple Watch, all these things that. Um, we never imagined as little kids, but they've grown up with Alexa just answering every question for them. Like, literally, all you have to do is wonder, and she will tell you what the answer is. These kids, this, this group, gaming and social media, I don't know how many of you have kids this age, but for some reason, they really love watching other people play online games live. And they think that's fun, and I don't get it, and I don't need to get it, but what we need to know is that they love doing that kind of stuff. So would they like 
virtual fishing activities? Would they like that kind of interaction through a social platform where they're watching other kids catch bass? I don't feel like hunting is a, is a social sport like that, but fishing could definitely be. This group, like, even though they're young, they get so much information coming at them all the time that they form opinions really early and they um, expect everything to be catered to them at their age level, at their experience level. So that Generation Alpha is an interesting group of folks coming through and they're 10 already. So knowing what we know about the audience, knowing that customers expect us to put them front and center, otherwise they're going to make other choices with how they spend their time, there are a few things that we can do to help shift from that, that gatekeeper mindset of we have the hunting and fishing licenses, you come to us if you want to go hunting and fishing, to hey, we have these amazing hunting and fishing opportunities and it's good for you and it's good for your family and let me tell you about going outdoors. So learning about our customers, really important insights. Shifting our mindset to putting the idea that we do things to help customers. One of the things that we've done that I don't actually have in the, the slide deck, but is a customer centric mindset that we've adopted is that instead of doing a new license or a new regulation cycle every year, like we were changing hunting and fishing laws on the public every single year. And every year they'd have to pick up that guidebook or that brochure and look for, oh no, what have they changed now? We've gone to an every other year regulation cycle. So we said to the public, we're trying to make it easier so we're doing this every other year, and our main focus for the next several years is reg reduction. Like, if we're doing new regulations, it's replacing or reducing the regulations that exist. Because you all know, like, it is overwhelming, especially for a new hunter or angler, or even somebody who hunts and fishes in one state and moves to another state to figure out all of the guy, all the guidelines, all the rules, it is not an easy thing to pick up when you can go out to a pickleball court on the same Saturday and have like three people tell you the rules and put a paddle in your hand and you're outside and you're enjoying time with others and you're getting a lot of the same benefits. So we are competing against all that other stuff. And then we use, we have a customer centered data culture. We use our data to figure out how we can serve them better, and then we work through that transformation. So this, here are all the pieces that it takes to make a really great experience for customers. And, you know, this is what, this is what I want from companies. This is what people expect when they interact with somebody. They, they want a company they can trust. They want, if something goes wrong, they want it resolved and, and resolved in a fair and quick and equitable way. We want people to exceed our expectations. We want, like, when things go really wrong, we want some compassion. Like, hey, I, I did this and I messed up. I bought the wrong thing, or I, I bought three fishing licenses. Can you please refund one? Like, we want, we want that understanding instead of that government, like, wall down kind of face. Personalization, like, again, I said it over and over again. We expect in this world that when we interact with an organization, they know who we are and they customize things for us. And we want it to be easy. Don't waste my time. I, don't, I got a lot going on. Don't waste it. So, you know, putting our money where our mouth is, we, we know this about customers. Yet, if you went to the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission today, 
you would have to enter all of your personal information in order to see what licenses are even available to be purchased. And I know we're not the only agency that does that. So not only do I want your date of birth and your address, I want your social security number. And then, then I'll let you see what's available for purchase. So taking that mindset, flipping it on its head, when we go to the, we're an S3 state, we're getting ready to implement the no, new core platform. Um, I'm not up here to be an ad for S3, but I'll do it a little anyway. What I like about this new platform is that you really can go into the system, you see all of the options for you, and it lets you create a customer profile. And that profile um, tracks everything that you've ever done with the agency, including Hunter Ed and Boater Ed certifications, including events and volunteers. Um, all of the things are in one spot. So we're looking at product first licensing. Let me see what I'm going to buy, and then I'll go through your hoops, your legal hoops, in order to get to it. This is that one-stop shop I was talking about. So this is, this is one of my fake profiles, because I have a lot of fake profiles right now as we're going through implementing a new system. But it lets me get messages directly from the agency, everything I've bought. It lets me save a credit card so I don't have to do that every time. I know what events, what landowner programs, all the Hunter Ed, Boater Ed certifications. Um, it will let me manage relationships. So if I had kids who were old enough to start buying hunting and fishing licenses for, but they're still minors, um, volunteering, all of the marketing, all the CRM stuff. Um, it's, it's like what we've been asking for as wildlife agencies for a really long time. The other thing we're getting ready to do is update our website. Like, our website doesn't look bad. This is not a terrible website. Um, it's got good graphics. It's got, like, it's a nice, it's a nice homepage. But it's not very customer-centric. So what we did when we started this website project, we had our ad company um, do a year-long assessment of what pages people were going to. We have 1,600 pages on our website, and there are eight that <laughs> fall into the category of more than 76,000 page views per year. So 1% on here is 76,000 views. Um, so I only have the first, what, 25 or so? And clearly, in 2021, whatever 36 times 76,000 is, Game check, buying licenses, knowing when the seasons and bag limits, or season dates and bag limits, licensing, fishing reports. Turns out people love, love, love fishing reports. General fishing regulations, and then we had some new stuff. So everything on there informed how we are designing our new website. So this is, this is our, this isn't live yet, this is our template that we're working on. So we took all of those top things, so remember those top things, and we put those top things on the top four buttons. And these four buttons change seasonally because we actually have the data to know that in January through March, 65% of people are coming for game check. Um, and April through June, not as many, but if you look at fishing licenses, that changes through the year. So we can change these top four things to really be what people are looking for at that moment. And then, like the search thing, if somebody's coming to look for CWD, they can type CWD into that search box instead of trying to go through and figure out where all this stuff is. Um, if you go to a lot of big websites, the Postal Service is one that I always go back to. The Postal Service has an amazing amount of information on their website, and if you go to their homepage, they have a really strong search engine, and it says, 
What are you looking for? And every time I say, hold mail, I don't know where it is on their website. I can just go to their search box. So that's, this is what's coming up for us. Oops, that was a green dot. So the other thing is that everything is super mobile, especially in our field. 83% of our website traffic two years ago was on mobile devices, and every year that increases. So we're looking at like 85% of people are going to the Game & Fish website on their phones or on a tablet sitting in front of the TV. They aren't doing this at their desktop very much. So what that says to us is that every single thing we put on that website better be really easy to use and find. So you can see these are three panels of our upcoming website. The first one is just the main web page and then our hunting page. So if they go to the top and do a drop down and go to hunting, and then the last one on the far right is the footer for every page. So it has um, just the real basic stuff that you would expect in a footer. The other thing is our app. Like right now we have this app on the right, but you can't buy a hunting and fishing license in our app. It sends you to the website. The new app that we're getting ready to implement as part of the S3 core system allows you to buy a license in the app and see all of those things that I showed you on that customer platform in your phone. So you can either do it through your web browser um, or you can download the app and see it on there. It just makes it much simpler. So that's, that is what, um, that's, that's the package of customer-centric, like, aha ideas that I thought were um, useful. And I'm happy to answer any questions about this, or R3 planning, or just whatever questions you feel like asking this afternoon. Like I said, I can't see any of you right now. So <laughs> it's uh, very anonymous if you yell a question at me. Um, I actually have a quick question. On one yeah. of the website mock-ups you had shown, like at the bottom it says what's trending, and I was wondering where that, uh, it's on the app, too. yeah, what's trending, where does that information, is that populated from people clicking on things, or what, how is that formulated? That's an outstanding question. <laughs> I, uh, um, I think we have control both ways, what people are clicking on, okay. but also what we want to make sure people are seeing. So if there's a, a new reg cycle coming up and we want public comments, we can put that on the what's trending. Yeah, I liked it because, you know, like Netflix has that. I'm like, oh, people like this show. I'm interested. So I, it caught my eye. So that's, that's cool. Yeah, because on this page, you go back to this one. On this page, those four boxes across the bottom that we're constantly changing would be a what's trending sort of idea. But there's something about that word, right? Yeah. Like, oh, this is what everybody else is doing on this website. Maybe it's worth looking at. <laughs> yeah. Questions, comments, things you all are doing in your states to be more customer forward? Question over there. So how hard was it to get upper people to go with the by yearly regulation changes? It came from one of our deputy directors who came in from the outside. Um, I will say that it wasn't hard for the commission or the directors to get on board with it. It was hard for the staff in wildlife and enforcement and fisheries to get used to the idea that if they needed to make a change, it was going to take some time. And the compromise was we can do emergency regulations throughout the year because they were like, but what if, right? We're very familiar with that in agency staff. Other questions? Yeah, I can see a green shirt. <laughs> uh, 
Um, is that based on internal website traffic or do you like cross reference anything else? Like say, for example, Google, uh, searches for Arkansas, uh, game and fish commission on here. Yes. Is that just internally? Um, yeah. What people search for this is Google analytics. From, oh, that's what's Google. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So our ad agency is very good at pulling all of the pages and I just took a snapshot of the top. It is a spreadsheet that goes all the way to the bottom pages. And sadly, some of the bottom pages are education pages that are so buried, nobody ever finds them. And that's the other thing about this list. Like we have a lot of good stuff on our website the public might be looking for or might want, but can't find it right now. So these are the pages that rise to the top. I don't know if there's other things that would rise to the top and we'll be able to adjust as we get data from that search bar. So if somebody's coming to our site and searching for the same thing, or not one person, but lots of people are searching for the same thing, and it's something we had buried so deep you couldn't find it before, we'll be able to adjust accordingly. Question over here. Hi, Tabby, it's Emily from Massachusetts. I do a lot of um, work on the R website i'm not sure you're talking about maybe your licensing pages but um when you showed your redesign but um i had kind of a comment that maybe we'll have a question in there as well so interesting to hear about the different generations and maybe this next the newest generations consuming information differently than maybe we can imagine we're lucky enough in massachusetts i think that our state website is starting to explore things like we, all our content is hosted on just the umbrella website um they're starting to roll out like a chat bot that mm -hmm. is you know able to answer questions i was a little bit nervous about what that meant for main maintenance um our content was identified because it is among the top hits especially our fishing content. So we've been able to kind of partner and cautiously move forward. So I guess I don't really particularly have a question in there, but just, I don't know, like being able to anticipate those new methods of customer service is just always on my mind and and uh, not being an expert at, at those kinds of things. It's, it's just interesting and slightly terrifying and somewhat exciting. <laughs> Yes, the AI stuff is crazy. Like, I don't know if you've been following any of it in the news, but some of the AI bots that they've created have started to become self-aware. Like, I wish, I wish I was outside of this box and all of these things where it's like, maybe we should turn that off. Like, um, there's one AI simulation, it's not even a simulation out there, that they built these characters based on the characters in Seinfeld and have let it go. And they have relationships and they have conversations and they talk about what it's like for the people that are watching them and wondering if they're stuck in a simulation, which makes people go, but are we stuck in a simulation? No, but yes, it is terrifying. And the newer generations are gonna grow up with it and not be weirded out by the fact that computers can think through a problem faster than humans can. Other questions or thoughts about AI and customer service? No? Yes. Can you explain chat GPT? I'm just kidding. No. Um, <laughs> um, out of curiosity, as you're going into your redesign, do you have conversations around further personalization, say based on like behavioral analysis, behavioral data you're collecting, for like return visitors? I have heard those conversations happening around me. Um, <laughs> I'm of course really focused right now because the website stuff is happening. I was in on the website stuff a lot early on um, because a huge part of our website falls under people wanting to be educated. So get the education manager involved, right? Um, the thing that will happen eventually is that our licensing system and our website will be integrated to the point that you don't know when you're on which one. Um, but we will have serious customer data about who they are, how they interact with the website, what they're searching for, 
and be able to customize through the CRM over time because um, Salesforce is a really powerful tool that will be integrated into this whole, the whole kit and caboodle, which is um, going to be really interesting to see. Other things? Yeah, I see a hand in the light. So I'm curious, um, as you were going through the redesign of the licensing system, did you make any big changes to how people can pay? How, how people could pay, like any additional payment options or uh, changes in your credit card processor, exciting things like that. <laughs> At this point, it's still, you have to enter a credit card. There's not a PayPal or Amazon shop or any of those options. It's, we, we are keeping on that like one payment path at this time. Doesn't mean we won't um, change over time, but it's so complicated to bring on a new license vendor that, not a new vendor, we, we're an S3 state already, but a new platform that we haven't, we haven't even talked about that. Um, I'm excited we have, in our nature centers, we have credit card machines and all of a sudden we can like tie some stuff together that has been separate systems that we've been paying for for a long time. Thanks. Hey. I was just uh, wondering with this customer centric approach to um, outreach and education activities, if you see it um, influencing other types of like public involvement and public comment processes if you're changing how you're doing that. Yeah, um, our Human Dimensions folks are amazing and um, work with us very closely on all of these pieces. So it's, I feel like we're in a constant world of gathering data about our customers in a lot of different ways. One of the things that we have talked a lot about is we are doubling down on private landowners. We started a whole separate private lands division, figuring out how we better serve private landowners by reaching out to them and asking them, are you aware of this stuff? What can we do to help you more? So it's that um, then there'll be channels and marketing to private landowners using our CRM based on a lot of that. So. While I tend to talk about classes and all of that piece, that's just my, that's my world, but this is meant to be an agency-wide platform. I don't know if that answered your question. That's the best answer I got. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very I think much, that Tabby. Was Jen. <laughs> Thanks.